HBI, I'd like to extend my deep and heartfelt thanks to Karen for her insight, commitment, and care in bringing this project to fruition. Later in the program, Karen will join Zoe Buckman in conversation. Finally, I'd like to extend my thanks to our collaborat collaborators at the Rose Art Museum. It's through their support that we were able to include Zoe Buckman's fabulous work, according to Grandma, on view in the, in the gallery. Um, and for their help in facilitating the loan and planning and executing two collaborative programs, we'd like to thank Ganit Ankori, Madeline Delfa, Yasmin Vera, and Rachel Farkas. It's my pleasure to introduce Madeline Delfa, Assistant Director of Programs and Community Engagement at the Rose Art Museum. Good evening. My name is Madeline De Delfa, and I am the Assistant Director of Programs and Community Engagement at the Rose Art Museum. And on behalf of the Hadassah Brandeis Institute and the Rose Art Museum, I'm honored to introduce Zoe Buckman. Born in Hackney, East London, Zoe Buckman studied at the International Center of Photography in New York and was awarded an Art Matters grant in 2017. In 2018, the Art Production Fund commissioned CHAMP, Buckman's first public art installation, the kinetic sculpture featured a glowing uterus with boxing gloves in place of ovaries, which stood 43 feet tall on Sunset Boulevard in Hollywood. In 2022, Pippi Holdsworth Gallery presented Buckman's first UK solo show, Blood Work, and earlier this year, Lyles and King Gallery presented Tended in New York's Lower East Side. I hope you have all had the opportunity to spend some time with Deeply Rooted, Faith and Reproductive Justice, curated by Karen Tabb, which features Buckman's powerful sculpture, according to Grandma, on loan from the Rose Art Museum's permanent collection. Composed of boxing gloves and Buckman's maternal grandmother's textiles, according to Grandma reflects on Buckman's experience of her first menstrual period, a moment marked by the Jewish tradition of slapping the young woman in the face. Buckman's use of embroidered textiles gives a sense of intimacy and places it along a continuum of feminist artistic practice. While interrogating these intergenerational bonds, referencing the violence and trauma that is often passed down along with tenderness, support, and love. It provides an unflinching depiction of womanhood, and this bravery and honest honesty is badly needed in a post ops world. According to Grandma, was acquired earlier this year, quite enthusiastically, I should say, by the Sam Hunter Emerging Artists Committee, and we have some members of the Sam Hunter Committee here tonight. Thank you. Um, and I just would like to give you a bit, a bit of background on that committee, which is named for the Rose Art Museum's founding director and which continues his legacy through the bold and adventurous acquisition of contemporary art. Just as Sam Hunter assembled the Rose's original collection in 1961 with works from the, at that time, rising artists of the 1960s, including Jasper Johns, Ellsworth Kelly, Roy Lichtenstein, Robert Indiana, Marisol, and among others, the Sam Hunter Emerging Artist Committee continues this tradition of prescient collecting. So Zoe Buckman is in very impressive company, and we are very proud to have this work in our collection and to welcome her this evening. So thank you for coming, and please join me in welcoming Zoe Buckman. Thanks, guys. Hi, everyone on Zoom. Is that Zoom? Hi, Zoom. Can they see me? They can see. Hi, Zoom. <laughs> Um, hi, thank you so much. Thank you for having me as part of this show. Yeah, we're good. Um, and I'm really, I'm really honored to be here. Um, so I'm just gonna, what I'm gonna do is just like cycle through some images of my work. And then me and Karen will have a, a conversation. And then if anyone has questions, um, yes, feel free to ask them at the end. Don't be shy, but don't be offensive. Um, that means you too, Zoomers. Um, all right. Please hold for technical. Talkies. Do I do this? Yeah, all right. Okay, great. So, um, well, so my first show, I actually, even though I've been making work for a long time and I started out um, with photography, uh, my first actual solo show was after I've become a mother. Um, and this is my placenta, which kind of became the sort of center point or main piece in that work. And I guess having a plastinated placenta on the Bowery kind of, I guess, 
put me in like started my career really because people were like why would you do that um and I was really I was really interested in time and mortality and and of course the female and maternal experience but really looking at how um fleeting life is because my placenta was apparently like defective so it was super lucky that I gave birth early when I did um and during that exhibition it was this beautiful gallery on the ground floor and um it doesn't exist anymore like a lot of galleries in New York but they also had this basement and they asked me if I wanted to expand the work and take over the basement and I was like all right fuck it like that's a challenge um and I didn't know what I was going to do down there, but I knew that if I was asking audiences to kind of descend these stairs, then I wanted to kind of descend what I was looking at and sort of look at the um, subconscious. And then I found my paternal grandmother's um, lace and... I then created this um, installation where I had embroidered. This was the first time I used embroidery as a grown up. Um, and there was also like a sound piece accompanying that work. Then I have this small baby and I started to think a lot about the messaging in the language that I personally use. You might have noticed I swear a lot, um, which I still do. But I and I still listen to a lot of hip hop music, but I, I, I had to kind of, I guess, grapple with and come to terms with the fact that there was a lot of misogynistic content in my favorite genre of music and there's a you know there's a whole backstory of growing up in Hackney East London um, and the culture there but it was a very it was it was a rough and violent culture um so I started to embroider uh, vintage lingerie with lyrics pertaining to women. And I had this show in LA. Um, and then it was the run up to the election of Donald Trump. And I was thinking a lot about abortion, about my own personal experiences with pregnancy and with abortion. Um, I started to box because I was going through a divorce and I'm sure, well, hopefully some people can relate to that. Um, and boxing ended up being this amazing space for me because it really put me in touch with, um, no, let me go back to that. It really put me in touch with my own relationship to masculinity, to toxic masculinity. I realized that in the environment that I grew up with and having these three brothers in the house, I, I am quite drawn to aggressive spaces and the boxing gym became this place that kind of put me back in touch with a more intuitive I guess animalistic part of my being um, and it also allowed me this space to kind of like I guess, process some past traumas and also start to get comfortable owning my space, which at, before that was not something I was very good at doing in this male dominated art world. Um, this was a piece that also had sound and uh, I used um, an audio recording that I had of, of me giving birth. Um, and then then the divorce happened and I was working through um, my feelings about that and many other things. And I started to think about um, ideas of perfection and chastity. And I started to examine the Madonna whore complex. And I was thinking a lot about this line of a Keats poem um, where he said in prison, her so no, he said, if thy mistress some rich anger shows in prison, her soft hand and let her rave. And so I called this work, let her rave. I was using a lot of um, like vintage and found wedding dresses. Um, and then I, I will hurry up. Let me see. Um, so then I really started to think about the home and that is a space that I've stayed in pretty much since this show. This was the beginning of a series called Heavy Rag, which I ended up exhibiting again in New York. And Sabine, who is here, was working at the gallery at the time. Hey. Um, so I was thinking a lot about the home. My mum was terminally ill and we were talking a lot about her experiences with violence, about the cover up, at least when she was um, a child within her home, about these things that are like not spoken about. We, we, you know, we were discussing periods and um, bleeding and bruising and 
I guess it's kind of ironic in a really horrible way, but I was actually at the time in a relationship in which I was not being physically um, taken care of and I was experiencing violence in that relationship. And so I started to collect these um, tea towels and I'm still honestly working with these. This was, oh yeah, so... I, I work with a lot of um, language in my work. And previously it was those, um, I guess my very first show with that table that was um, in the basement, that was the text there was from a dream that I'd had. And people kept on referring to it as a poem. They would be like, I liked the placenta, but my favorite piece was your poem. And I was like, I didn't write a poem, but okay. Um, then of course I was working with the lyrics and then I was kind of using this, these, this Keats quote. And then I started to, I guess, embrace the idea that maybe, maybe I could try writing my own stuff. And so I started writing this poem called Show Me Your Bruises Then, which started out when I did this show, it started out as three pages. And by the time, and then when this show closed and I was finally out of that really, um, uh, I guess, violent relationship, this three page poem became seven pages um, to be continued. But during this time, my mom, yeah, she was dying of terminal cancer. And then after she passed for this show in New York at Fort Gansport, I really wanted to think about the gallery, about the space. And they had these beautiful um, original wooden bars in this three-story gallery. And so I wanted to present something to do with tea it was really important to me I was like this gallery is it was a townhouse I'm like it's the home this is work about home tea is mum and home and ritual to me and so I started to make these teacups which of course I was then um, manipulating and cutting bits out of and then they would get misshapen and I was thinking a lot about how grief and trauma really takes pieces out of you but you're still kind of whole but there's bits missing and you're kind of the same, but you're not. And, um, and so I was thinking about, about, yeah, grief and trauma and also how her body, my mother's body had, um, you know, in, in front of my eyes sort of changed and deteriorated. Um, that was around the time as well that for some of these boxing glove clusters that I continued to work with, I, I started to do these pairings where one was almost like slipping away. Um, and that piece was acquired by the Baltimore Museum, which is very nice of them to do that. And this is according to grandma. So I'll just explain a little bit about this work. Um, so one of the things that, you know, my mom was talking about and she had written about because my mother was a writer. Um, she wrote this play for the BBC called The Slap. And <clears throat> for her, she didn't know The Slap was coming. And I should preface this by saying that I realized when I showed this work in New York that about half the Jewish women women who saw it were like oh yeah I got the slap and then the other half were like what is this slap thing Zoe <laughs> but what happened to my mum is that she shared a room this is East End Cockney London she shared a room with her grandmother she got her period for the first time this was also a very traumatic home for her she thought it was wrong it was dirty she tried to like you know get rid of it with bleach and then she applied bleach to her own body and it stung and she sobbed and all this and all these things and finally she falls asleep and her grandma wakes her up and just slaps her around the face and um my mom cries and then and then her grandmother cuddles her and says you know may your babies be safe and they cry and and it ended up being this um I guess I don't know like it had a nurturing end to it this experience for my mum but we were talking a lot about how in traditions maybe not religions maybe this is a tradition thing but culturally all over the world we mark um, a woman's journey with an act of like pain and um and so for this work I used um some textiles that belong to my maternal grandmother um and again, in all of these pieces, the reason why I like to collect lots of different um, tea towels and hankies and tablecloths and all of these things is because I'm really talking about how like together we are whole and we, but we all have these different experiences. We all come from different places, um, races, um, economic statuses and whatnot. But 
there are so many commonalities throughout the female femme-bodied experience that I think unite us. And for me, it's always been in times of huge grief and transition and trauma. It's always been my women, my best friends who come over and, and take care of me. And, you know, and we, I do that back, bring food because someone's died. And, you know, I love that about being a woman. Um, and being in community and I've always wanted my work to to also explore this joy that abounds in our experience then I started to think about miscarriage because then I was in another relationship after the pandemic and I oh no that's not that I'm sorry this is um the last line of that poem this is then and this piece I showed um in London at that um at my exhibition blood work so then it's the pandemic I've got this poem and I think I want to make a film my first video piece of video art and um I went to three different actresses the amazing Sienna Miller the incredible Kush Jumbo both two girlfriends of mine and this third actress who lived in Chicago and um each one of them said yes we'll do it I explained what I wanted to do which was shoot them um at, in my mum's living room with a cup of tea reciting the poem and then I would cut it all together um but the third actress she dropped out because understandably the pandemic she didn't want to get on a on a on a flight um and it was actually Sienna who was like you have to be the third person I was like no 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 I'm not an actress I don't do that and she was like Zoe Buckman like this this is these are your words this is your story just shoot it with you and if you hate it like you can edit it out and recast or reshoot another time so this is show me your bruises then it's a three channel video installation that I was supposed to be um debuting in September but we'll, we'll get to that later um there are also in in the film there are these sort of I call them moving still lives these close-ups of like soaking up a stain um you know there was tea pouring from a kettle into a cup and leaking out um ah during the pandemic I also started to embroider forms for the first time and so as you've seen like nothing in my art practice until this point I I, I never depicted actual figures there were never any women um it was always what either goes inside a woman, what comes from a woman, what a woman sleeps in or wears or is on a woman's table, but I, there were never any bodies. And then as I'm sure a lot of you can relate to, I felt really isolated and I found myself looking back at photos of, of my girlfriends and my friends and just reminiscing and feeling so um, lacking of bodies that I thought, all right, if you're gonna do this, you can try and do it now. And the reason I hadn't, embroidered um I hadn't I hadn't depicted forms was because I didn't personally think that I would be able to do that without contributing to what I feel is an sort of over objectification of the female form within art and so I I had to figure that out um but these these embroideries were taken from photos um, and I did them myself I call that my abortion cluster. It's actually called dilation and curatage. And that is currently at the Broad, Broad MSU. Um, I, 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 knew, I know that there's some artists, I think, in attendance. So I just wanted to add these two slides in to just show that um, I've had opportunities to present public works that um, for me are a sort of adjacent to my art practice. I was asked by Four Freedoms if I wanted to do something in the summer of 2020 and um, if I wanted to do a billboard and all I could think about was Breonna Taylor. So um, I made that billboard for her and then this was my Times Square midnight moment. Um, and then this was my last show and I'm almost done. Uh, this was at Lyles and King. The show was called Tended. It closed uh, mid-October. And um, it's the largest scale I've ever worked in. For the first time, I was taking actual tablecloths and then painting with ink, 
doing a shitload of embroidery and then appliquing on top of the works and then even like staining with ink afterwards. I almost, it was too much work. It's like, I, I don't ever want to work that hard again, but um, <laughs> this is also the first time that I started to depict, um, I guess, femmes in my life and um, trans friends as well. So this was the first time that I, it, it just sort of happened. It wasn't a decision to not only depict um, cisgender women I was just looking at these moments and um, wanting to capture tenderness that I saw I felt at the time which I don't necessarily feel anymore but I felt at the time that I was really ready having worked through you know trauma and a lot of shitty things I really felt that I was ready to look at my friendships and my connections and make work that explored the way that we love and care for each other I'm since not, not so sure about that. Um, <laughs> this is actually a double self portrait. This piece is called The Dark Morning of a Day and is very much about the morning that I went to go have an abortion. And the person who had put me in that situation didn't join me. Um, it's my sister-in-law. That piece was um, at Massimo Di Carlo in Hong Kong. And then last, well, yeah, almost lastly, I really felt that this piece kind of summed up the whole show for me. Um, it was, I took this photo of my mum nine years before she died. So I loved that I was like returning to photography or at least sort of a nod to my, the, my beginning. Um, and she had just been diagnosed with cancer and I went home to London and I, we dyed her hair purple because she knew she was going to lose it and so I took this photo of her and then nine years later when at the very very end she's in hospital and she sent me these two text messages and I'll, I'll just I embroidered them and I'll just read them because for me that is a lot of what this work was she says what nights are ghastly though despite breaking it in breaking it up into diff activities drink tea clean self try to read clean self eat apple etc etc and then she sent me another text that said, oh, fuck, I didn't mean to send that. I've just spent the last hour chatting to this woman, women in the ward, and it's such a privilege to know them. I feel much stronger. See you if slash when you come. And that to me, I, I, I'm just so inspired by this woman being in, I think, what we can all agree is unarguably the worst situation and she feels hopeless and she's fucking over it. And then she's able, <clears throat> she's able to find joy in, in, in the people around her and in, and in their strength. And she's able to see that like this woman was so warm that, that she, she radiated it. And then it, that would be reflected back to her um this piece was very much about there's a lot of stuff in this show about kind of like hospitals was a bit of a theme um it was a blueprint or oh I don't know if I'm allowed to share this well fuck it um this piece just got acquired by the ICA Miami so that's nice yes come on I haven't received the check yet thank you I haven't got paid yet but I hope I will um it's me and my sister-in-law like so she met my brother when I was like 17 or 18 and a year of blow dries and like the 2000s and I was doing my A-level art project and I just thought I was so profound that I was going to draw on the bodies of my friends and photograph them and I guess um I guess I'm still kind of doing that in a way, but just much better. Um, this is one of my best friends who survived two cancer surgeries. She's also lost her mum. She's also a nurse. She's an absolute badass. And I love to depict her in my work often. And in this piece, which is, is close up, there's this beautiful scar that runs down her tummy and she just exudes like just badassness. And this, the last piece is, oh, no. Well, that's a close-up of a self-portrait that will be at Miami Art Basel next month. That's my niece, who I miss and love. And there we go. That's the last piece, which um, 
uh, it was a controversial conversation during freeze because I'm wearing a mug and David, a star of David around my neck. And it was right when there were these planned protests in the center of London and my gallery understandably decided that they didn't feel they were equipped to put this work in the booth at the time in case um, someone like, I don't know, I guess vandalized it or whatever, but um, we will be showing it in Miami. And that that is it. Thanks guys. Hi. So, um, I wanted to ask you um, why it was important for you to say yes. So I came to uh, visit you in your studio. You were working on all of these crazy, crazy stitching uh, embroidery pieces. Um, and this was uh, um, according to grandma was hanging in your uh, living room. Uh, still took you about two seconds and you said, yes, I'll be in the show. Um, so I was curious to know um, why it was important for you to be in a show that spoke about reproductive justice um, and how does this piece that we picked uh, tie into it? Thank you. Um, I think what I really responded to in your, in your initial email to me was not just that it was... Um, speaking about reproductive justice, but the, the entry point into the show was about the Torah. And I, my Jewish identity um, is something that, that came from my mother, even though my father um, is, some, is a Sephardic Jew who, you know, he, he was a total atheist. He is a total atheist, has no Jewish kind of culture and identity. Um, but comes from a Sephardic family that at some point had their name changed. But my mother, that was, you know, again, home. And she was the like Yiddish slang, you know, my grandmother's, every, that was where I got my personal Jewish identity. And I think that um, when you lose, I think quite, I guess it's common that like when you experience the death of, your mom or someone so significant to you in your family and she was my best friend I think it's natural to try and like double down on the things that you got from them so like I didn't used to drink white wine <laughs> I was a red wine girl and then but my mom was like it's a nice cool glass of white wine um and then after she died I would find myself just I'm like I have to have a glass of white wine um so around uh, 2019, I started to just want to be in more Jewish spaces and learning a lot more about my my own culture and heritage, which then, of course, I looked around and I just saw um, even back then just this this mounting anti-Semitism. And I and I started to learn a lot more about that and see it and and seek out more information about it and start speaking vocally about it. So even though I've always, or for a long time, have made work about reproductive justice, when you approached me, I was like, oh, wow, this is this is two, two things that are very, very dear to me in one. So I hope that answers your question a little bit. Um, so talk a little bit more about, um, we've been speak, talking a lot today about um, how outspoken you've been about your Judaism. Um, about anti-Semitism um, and what the repercussions have been for you. Um, you alluded to them earlier. Thank you. Um, well, it doesn't make you popular. <laughs> um, and for me, like I approach everything from a, from a human, human level on a human place. And I, I'm anti all suffering across the board. And I think it's also, I guess I want to say, and, because it's definitely not but, but, and I think it is natural that when you yourself have experienced um, an injustice and oppression, um, 
it, it puts you more in touch with that. It makes you more sensitive. So for example, as a woman, when I read a story about someone who's been raped, like that is going to hit my chest or affect me more than someone who hasn't been raped, who's reading that same story. And I think that's okay. Um, so I've always felt that it's okay for me to talk about anti-Semitism. And I, I wish I would be joined by other people, um, but it's all right. It's all right if I'm not, I'm just gonna keep doing me and, and speak about injustices as I always have, but also like, it's okay that I'm more um, vocal about things that I have personal experience about, because I think that's important. Um, and yes, very recently I, I lost a lot of friends and, um, yeah, I don't know why I just had yesterday, I just learned that um, I, two years ago, a curator from a museum approached me and asked me if I wanted to have my first museum solo show. And I said, yes. And it was um, going to be looking back over 10 years of work about um, abortion, miscarriage and birth. And the, the museum was also going to commission a sculpture and they were also going to debut my film in this little sort of in the screening room bit of the museum. And it was all really exciting. And, you know, the board signed off on it, which was the big hurdle some time ago. And then yesterday they just cancelled it 10 months before the opening. And um, I don't I don't know why. I don't know why I would like to find out and I'm going to work to find out why and what part of the work or what part of me um, is uh, unpalatable <laughs> during this time. But um, I am a bit suspect. Yeah. So do you think it's is your feeling that it's because of how outspoken you've been since the um, events of October 7th? that occurred in Israel. And you do you want to talk a little bit about how outspoken you've been about? Um... Well, I, um, I, I don't, I wouldn't want to say that, that, that I think is because of that, because at this point, I just don't know. And I'm super into like fact checking and not um, jumping to conclusions. But something's fishy. They've cut like the, the bullshit excuse they gave. Anyway, they've, they've dropped me and killed the show and so that is quite an uncommon thing for a museum to do so close to a show and when you've been spe you've spent so many years preparing for it um in terms of being uh outspoken about uh october 7th is that my thing is that that could have been me and i i want to um I guess I've 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 wanted to speak about what happened and for it to be to foster a conversation where we're able to hold two truths um, because that is so important to me when it comes to and always has been when it comes to Middle East and Israel and Palestine it's like two things multiple things can exist together and at once and that is that really needs to be spoken about um, and so I've been trying to. Uh, foster that kind of dialogue but ultimately that is an incredibly hard space to try and carve out especially online because it's just not set up for that kind of thinking um so yeah it's been tough so quick pivot um talk a little bit about your artistic process like um you're thinking about an idea how do you develop it? Where does it come from? You look at materials, etc. Thank you. Um, I guess it's different. It's different for each series, but it always it's always something that I am struggling with at the time. So I guess I guess also what I'm I'm realizing when I cycle through my work like that is that it is um, it's autobiographical graphical and it's chronological do you know what I mean it's like this is what I'm seeing and feeling and experiencing and that's what I have to do in my studio right now and it doesn't mean that every piece I make in the studio is going to end up in a show or I might even start a series and be like this is not good but um but I guess the work is so labor intensive 
that for me to spend that kind of time on something like I have to really really want to explore it and depict it yeah so it starts so sometimes it can be um a, something that I've written or um or have read and then I'll start looking at images at least since I started to depict forms a lot of the time I'm looking at photos that I've taken and that's that's been important to me so far that these are like real lived experiences and moments between me and people that I love as opposed to like getting a, a model to come to the studio and that's that's a beautiful process for many artists but that's not what I've done so far yeah um, so Talk about um, the woman in your life that you um, hold so near and dear and how you talk about it being an autobiographical um, journey um, and these women who keep coming up in your life and some who unfriended you in the last few days. <laughs> um, talk a little bit about um, the idea of, of womanhood um, for you. Um. I think that what I've realized is that I surround myself with or by, um, with, I surround myself with powerful women. Um, and, you know, we all love to go out dancing and we're all a bit loud um, and we're quite fierce and we love fiercely. And and then I realized that every every woman I know is a survivor of some kind of trauma or injustice you know she's either experienced violence or um has had some kind of like reproductive obstetric trauma or she's been told to shut up or subjugated in some way um and so I've I've wanted to de depict not just my experiences but there's two but also at the same time like I'm not into like either being a victim and I don't look at the women in my life as victims as victims either so I've always wanted to explore like joy and love in the work yeah yeah so I'm I'm I've always been drawn to textiles that have been used so like I don't go to Pottery Barn and buy napkins um my studio as you've seen is like an old lady's antique store like it's full of freaking hankies and veils and all of these trinkety stuff um and I like I hoard it and then and then I feel like I'm working with things that have had a life, that have been used, have been on someone's table, have seen some wild, fun evenings, have seen some tears around the, the kitchen table. Maybe there's um, stains or burns or what have you. Um, so that's really important to me. And then I'm, I've obviously been aware for some years of how working with textiles and using things like embroidery, I'm kind of falling in line with this feminist kind of, um modality and this this history of female expression um which wasn't deliberate to me it just sort of happened but I am aware of that what was the transition from uh photography to embroidery and how do you see those two connected if at all so <clears throat> so photography really freaked me out from day one so I was at ICP and um I, I thought that I called myself a fine art photographer um, and I was taking pictures of women in my life but then I was etching onto the glass of the photo frame like snippets of conversations that I overheard this work was horrible I destroyed it all horrible horrible I hope I hope no one has pictures of it it's really bad work but um but I, I didn't like photography because I was like, I take an image and then it gets spat out over here in another room. Or if it's digital, I could lose that, that um, disc. Like it just, it did, I, I was like, what do I touch? What do I hold? And I was always more interested in, in the object, which is why I was kind of trying to bring in the glass of the photo frame. Um, then when I became, when I, when I became pregnant, all my creativity went into my body and then when I was finally ready to start making work again, I found the experience of, of, of giving birth and becoming a mother, which I've only done once, um, 
I found it really, really empowering. Um, and even though I then later found out that there was apparently something wrong with my placenta, um, I found the experience of giving birth. It just, it put me in touch with a power that I just didn't know that I had. I did it without pain meds. I did it at home. Um, and from that point on, I was like, okay, if I can do that, then I don't have to just be a fine art photographer. Like I can just be someone that creates. And so that really opened me up and I began to play in the studio. And then when I found that lace table runner that belonged to my grandma, I just was like, oh, embroidery. Okay. So I guess we're going to do that now. And whether it's ceramics or glass or neon or the film that I made, I've always sort of come back to embroidery or textiles in some way, but I do recognize that I'm also continually adding to my to my art practice and then having to learn on the job, which has always been quite exciting because, you know, you're learning new things. Um, so we spoke about what's not next, but what else is next for you? What are you th what are you thinking in terms of um, your your next your next idea, your next vision? I have some some group museum shows upcoming and the next one will be at um, SF MoMA so that will be cool but obviously the work is done and it's it's older work um, I feel very strongly that um, there's a part of of what's going on right now which is to do with the denial of rape that is very very hard for me to not um, feel very strongly about <laughs> um, and it's personal and I, I can't imagine that not being part of what I do next but it's just I'm in this weird place now having hi having um, my show just close in New York um, where for the first time in over 10 years like I haven't made work for eight weeks and I've just been so disgusted by the world, by what I've seen, by what I'm continuing to see in Gaza, the what's coming out um, of Israel, what I'm seeing online, this the the division and the ugliness, what I'm seeing in my own community and industry. I'm so disgusted that for the first time in my life, I haven't, I can't make work right now. Um, so. I'm also reminding myself that like, wow, Zoe, you're a machine. You haven't stopped for 10 years through like your mother's funeral and this, that, and the other. Like you, you never stopped. I never, ever, ever stopped. So it's okay to be in this kind of place right now of, of stasis because I think I'm, I'm processing a lot and it will 100%, it will be coming out in the studio at some point, but maybe in the new year. <laughs> So I wanted to open up for questions either um, on the Zoom or in person if anyone has uh, questions for Zoe or about the show. Um, feel free to raise your hand. Um, yes. Hi, Adrian. <laughs> All fabulous. Amazing work. Thank you. I'm just struck by you mentioned that you had really good friends who all of a sudden unfriended you. And we're all experiencing that moment when you, I certainly have, when somebody's posting something, I'm like, wait, who are they? How good? They're my friend. I thought I knew them, you know, and it's this very distant communication. You know, these aren't necessarily, sometimes they're good friends, sometimes they're a little bit removed and you kind of put them in a box and now all of a sudden, that box is not so it doesn't fit anymore and trying to negotiate how you manage that relationship going forward I'm curious if you could say more yeah um so I I have three 20 year friendships in London that within I don't know at what point in the first week after October 7th they the three of them unfollowed me on mass and I, I haven't heard from them since but these are like um one of them spoke at my mother's funeral. Um, one of them, I'm the godmother to her daughter and she was supposed to come stay with me. Um, they're white women. 
and they don't apart from one one is not a white woman um but I think a lot about this this one friend who was going to come and stay with me in October we just hadn't landed on the date and she's the one whose daughter is my is, is my goddaughter and um when I realized that they had done that it like it hurts so so acutely like again I make work about the tenderness of 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 women in community with each other I make work about like beautiful platonic sisterhood and so to have this experience through everything that we've been through over the years to have that happen was a huge huge grief in a time where we're all grieving and we're all, a lot of us who are connected to the region are experiencing a lot of generational trauma with whatever side you're connected to um so it's been really really hard and it's also I have to find gratitude in it in that I have to say all right this was a lesson I needed to learn about where we're at right now. And that if there is a part of my identity that is not tolerable to someone who I love, then they're not a friend. Do you know what I mean? And I think we, I always leave the door open. Any of these three women, if they, if they reach out to me, I will absolutely have a conversation. I would love to have a conversation and talk to them about like what part of my Jewish pain in this moment was so gross to you that you that you that you excommunicated me. That's the piece that shocks me as right. a 20 year friendship would be ended digitally somehow rather right. than wow, that really triggered me. Are you not thinking about the, you know right. that it wasn't a phone call or just wow. Yeah. And it's 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 especially interesting when it's um women who aren't or friends who aren't actually don't have skin in the game so me and a Palestinian girlfriend of mine we good like we reached out to each other instantly like babe and I'm like babe and we're both like not in my name not in my name do you know what I mean and um and I have the same with other Muslim friends of mine um but it it just shows me where we're at right now in society in that I think we're, people are so, we're, we've been taught to center ourselves in the narrative so much that we we think everything's about us. Do you know what I mean? So like, again, to bring it back to this white woman, she's like, somehow she's offended. I'm like, babe, this wasn't about, like, what are you talk, like, why are you offended? Like, what, and we can't have a conversation? Um, it's just a sign of the times and, and how divided we are and how it, like people aren't having actual conversations. And I think uncomfortable conversations are very important right now. Yeah. Yeah, I know they've done questions. I'll read some of the Zoom questions. Yeah. We have, uh, Shelly says, you've been through so much. Your art tells a very personal story was part of your effort through your art to communicate to men in your life? And if so, did it affect them? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> there's this, oh, God. Um, okay, so one thing is that I remember when I, at the opening of that show that I did in New York, where according to grandma came from that show, Heavy Rag, my big brother came to the opening and, and I loved this response because the piece that you saw when you came into the gallery was a tea towel that had embroidered um, inaction is apathy, is collusion, is violence. And then you go through this whole show that has the sort of poetry, embroidery and whatnot, and then you and the, with the ceramics, and then you come back and he was like, then that's the last thing you see. And he's like, fuck Zoe, like, that's calling me out. And I said, yes, I'm not, I'm not personally calling him out, but there is a woman somewhere that needs to call you out, Michael Buckman. Um, and, and he's like, wow, you're really making me think about like my responsibility and like my culpability and like the violence and oppression of women. And I was like, yes, thank you. Thank you for understanding my work. Um, so that I, I love when I have responses like that. And then like 
did it feel good to do that Times Square midnight moment and stand up in Times Square and recite a poem to strangers about the, the experience of being left after a miscarriage to take care of a $3,000 blood work bill on my own because my my then mu um, musician boyfriend, I can really pick him, um, had left and taken my shit and blocked me and then left me with this bill. But then there I was, not only did I make a whole show called Blood Work, which ended with, you know, guess I'll pick up the blood work bill and the fucking tip. That was the last piece of the show. Not only did I make back the $3,000 that he owed me, but I got to stand there doing this poem with the um, trumpet player from The Roots, who he will never get to work with, who he wanted to work with. Do you know what I mean? Because he was like, oh, wow, you know, Dave Guy of The Roots, do you think maybe I can do a session with him? I was like, maybe, but... I guess now I'm going to do a session with Dave Guy from The Roots. Um, so it is, there is a quality of the work that has a slight sense of revenge. Not, It's not the driving force of each series, absolutely not. But it is a, a power that I think is okay to harness. And I think a lot about Sophie Cowell. Um, so when I was in school and I was studying photography, the teacher was like, oh, you're you're etching text onto the frame. Do you know about Sophie Cal? And I went and I saw her solo show at Paula Cooper Gallery called Take Care of Yourself, which is like the single most amazing badass solo show I've ever seen in New York. And um, not to like go on about it too much, but basically she got broken up with via email and she's this amazing French like incredible woman and she took the email and she gave it to a hundred different women in France and she asked them to interpret it but you walk into the gallery and you get a copy of the email and you read it and you're like wow this guy was like not nice and then you see all of this work from all of these women all mentioning his email and I was like that's that's brilliant yeah sure. Sure. Um, thank you so much for being here. Thanks to everyone who made it possible. I wanted to know about the second slide, which had the lace. Um, I wanted to understand a little more if you if you could help us how you came about going to an inst a full installation and how you chose the table and I think there were books and then you mentioned an audio recording. So if you could maybe talk a little bit about Yeah, absolutely. Should we pull it up? Is that possible? Is it too late? Um, so basically, giving, being given the opportunity by the gallery to like take over their basement as well as the ground floor, it was it was dark and dingy. And I thought, all right, well, I have to, I, I'm not going to like light this and do like hang traditional work in this space. Um, I want to make, the space work for me and I realized that a lot of my work has often been about being inspired by the gallery or or, or the room um and so because that work was about um the subconscious and the really weird fucked up dreams I was having when I was pregnant um I created this installation where there was sand on the floor there were these hand-blown um glass you guys call them shallots we call them shallots and um reason being is that I had gone home to London and as you can see throughout my my practice like the kitchen table has always been like the, it's the heart of the family it's the meals around the kitchen table cups of tea and elbows on the table and tears and all the rest of it and in my family it was Sunday roasts like and I had gone home pregnant and my dad had burnt the, the shallots and he was stressed about it. And that night I had a dream that I had given birth to this crispy kind of shallot bird. <laughs> it was a bird with a beak and it was gooey, but it had, it was like encased in this sort of like shallot crispy shell. And I held it and I realized like my heart, I just loved this baby so much with its blinking eyes, bird baby. But I also realized at the same time that I would never hear its voice because of the beak. Um, so 
Uh, and that broke my heart. So I made this installation. I embroidered um, the text from that dream. And then I had sand on the floor and the two sound installations. One of them was the sound of waves, the ocean. And the other one was the sound I had secretly recorded um, my last family meal um, at the dinner table before my parents sold our house in Hackney. And so people sat there and it, it ended up being the sort of most moving part of the show. And people was like, you know, you heard this sort of the hustle and bustle of a, of a family meal and clinking glasses and eating and whatnot. And they, and they read the text. And I guess to answer your question, I, I don't know why I did it, <laughs> but um, it was definitely a period where I was just really explorative. And, um, and when given the opportunity to do an, an installation that is a bit atypical for me and to take things off of, of the gallery wall, I absolutely relish it. Um, I went to a studio in the East Village in 2015. Oh I just had to remind myself of the date. We, my friend and I thought it was much sooner um, with the American Friends of the Israel Museum. Oh, I think it was like the Young Associates. Yeah. And I'll always remember your placenta. And I saw we came in a little late. Where is it now? It's um, it's in my living room now. <laughs> it's in my living room, and it was gonna be um, at this at this museum show that was looking at you know birth and miscarriage and abortion. All that was gonna we were gonna schlep it um, to that show before it was cancelled. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's been in my living space for a while, which has been interesting. When yeah, when people visit, it's interesting to see the response because there's definitely been some. <gasps> I'm like, sorry, it's my placenta. Um, yeah, yeah. Please. Um, I'm curious about how you manage the idea of being um, autobiographical in your work and at the same time doing very labor intensive work. So I'm curious, like, do you find yourself at some point having reached um, a time where that story is not as strong or alive in your life and how do you manage that because yeah that's the work especially because you're sewing and, and, and absolutely absolutely I think that um every piece I've ever made that has taken so so long to make like I've been sickened by it by the end and like I, I'm like I hate it I hate it I hate it and people are like, what are you talking about? So I'm like, just don't say anything. It's horrible and I hate it. Because it but it took a month. Um, but then luckily the process of it goes away and it gets framed. And then when you see it, when you're installing your show, you're like, oh, like it feels like you've had a break from it. And I think taking breaks from the work is is super important. Um a lot of the reason why I, I shifted to start making this work tended about like about tenderness and, and joy was because from blood work and show me your bruises then and heavy rag I've been in this place where I was exploring that violent experience being abandoned by that person and I was done so like when I stood in London at, at, in Pippi Halsworth's gallery and I saw uh, blood work installed I was like oh I'm like I've I'm finished with this. It's the end of the story um, of this chapter. And I think that I've I've processed a lot of different things and then and and come through them. Um, I just didn't want any more source material. That's the thing. I was like, I'm making work about joy now. I'm making work about love. And now here we are, we're back in this kind of like, oh yeah. Um, somebody on the Zoom uh, asked if you would be find it exactly making work about um, what you're going through now with BBI. It says, thank you for your support of Israel and for standing up against anti-Semitism. Do you think you will ever incorporate this into your work? Um, I, I think 110% like my Jewish identity and Jewish personhood is um, definitely going to be a part of of what I make in in a in a more kind of um, explicit way for for quite a while. I imagine. I feel like 
with the stuff with my mom and my grandma it's always been there and my child who's depicted a lot in these works um and you've seen some of the text that is like shh blah, 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 and that's part of of the film and the poem there's a lot of like I have the actresses come back often to say shh blah, 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 because it is that's what you know that's again like that's home um but with what what we're experiencing and and again with these with the denial of of sexual violence and the denial of rape is just I just can't I'm not going to be able to not make work about that it's just not going to be fun <laughs> I don't want to do it <laughs> no I'm not exhibiting in LA right now. The you know, what's really sad is that the public um, sculpture, the the big neon that was on um, is <laughs> on Sunset Boulevard, is turned off right now, and they got they turned it off because the Standard Hotel and it's like on the property of the Standard Hotel got sold. And so now we don't know who owns it. I'm like, I guess Art Production Fund owns it. I don't. Well, I don't have the space for it. Um, but uh, it they turned the light off and then and then Roe v. Wade was overturned. I'm like, you guys, this is just it's very bad. It's still like the, the bat signal has been taken down. Um so I was gonna say I have that in LA, but right now nothing, nothing. I don't even have that in LA. So let's make that happen. I need another show in LA. It's been a while. I'm just telling you, Karen. I'm like, I need, come on. <laughs> I know. And it goes, Poof. yeah. As your child, I have my own response to your artwork, Karen. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's my daughter's chat. <laughs> I'm curious what your child's response has been to being depicted and whether or not they see something different yeah. or have a different relationship with other people. Yeah. yeah, that is, thank you so much for that question. I, it's not, I'm not, I'm going to be completely honest with you all. Um, it's not, I've learned where I should have had more separation of church and state. So you you came to the East Village where my studio was at the top of the house. After I got divorced, um, I had this sort of like loft apartment in Dumbo and my studio was basically my living room. And that was the time that I really started to, explore like rape and sexual violence um and it was all whilst I had this six seven eight nine year old and for sure they would come home and, and go like see the work and and love it and appreciate it and but also go like well what's that about and and well did that happen to you mom kind of thing and that it has they have expressed to me recently that they found it really hard to to know more than most children would know what I was going through um but they are and they're an amazing artist already as a 12 year old and they also recognize that they got that from me um but that um they also recognize that they are aware that women feel pain mums cry mums feel grief when they lose their mum like we're not like these perfect pillars that keep it all tight and buttoned together and so so they've been a part of my my grief and the things that have been really difficult but I did move the, the main reason why I moved to where I live now where you came I moved I live in, in Bedstuy now and my studio um is on on the ground floor and I live above it and that has been so important because I can be messy and I can be me and let it all spill out and then I can close the door and be a mum and so that has been really really good for us but I've been learning on the job um and I've made some mistakes how has it been for you? How's it been for you guys? <laughs> we'll talk about it. Yeah. Wine. We'll talk about it with wine. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Is that, yeah. We can take one, one question. question and then and then is there one more? Is there one more? Is there one more in the room? Okay. Go ahead. So I think. Um 
where are you finding the light these days? <laughs> Yeah. <clears throat> American pharmaceuticals. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard. Yeah, everyone's like, I went up. I'm like, I went up twice. Um, it's really hard. I'm I'm super, super grateful for my kid. I'm honestly, I'm super grateful for for my ex-husband. We're amazing friends and great co-parents and after the pandemic and, you know, picking each other up and being there for each other and now this, and we're so aligned um, in our in our feelings and responses to what's happening right now. So I am, I have to remind myself of these beautiful um, friendships. And of course my sister-in-law, my brothers in London and, and, and a small few amazing friends in New York. So I, I'm finding the light in that. Um, but I'm not finding the light as much as as I as I wish I was. And so that I have to, that has to be an effort. You know, I need to go on walks. I need to see the leaves in Central Park. Like I need to take in artwork and go to museums or like get out of New York. I think it's super important that we have to start prioritizing. I think a lot of us have probably been in this like survival mode of like oh my god oh my god oh fuck oh my like just constantly consuming news and social media and worrying and and um and it's not that we should we can't look away can't look away from what is is happening and what's going to come but like we have to um also protect ourselves right now because yeah otherwise we're all fucked <laughs> On that positive note. <laughs> so I'll say um, a couple of things. First of all, thank you so much, Zoe. Um, so the funny story is that Shine, my daughter, uh, said to me the other day, Zoe Buckman's coming to the gallery. How come? I said, because she's in the show. She said, wait, but I follow her too, unbeknown to us. And the reason she said to me, that um, she follows you is because you stand up for what you think is right and um and i wanted to thank you for that because you uh, for standing up for what's right you stand up for all of us so thank you for that um we'll get through this somehow um in in community um so for that i thank you too um Tomorrow at noon, if you're interested in uh, another talk with one of the artists in the show, we'll be talking um, with Andy Ornowitz, who is in Jerusalem and whose watercolors are in the show. Um, Andy has five son, son, two sons and three son-in-laws currently uh, in Gaza. And uh, so it puts a whole different spin on what we were talking about. Um, one of them was recently injured, so she'll be sharing tomorrow over Zoom, um, both about her work and about what motherhood is like for somebody in her situation. So uh, do join us. And then we'll be out in the gallery and do check out all the other events that are associated with this show. There are a lot. It's kind of been amazing. Um, so check the calendar. And thank you to HBI and to The Rose. Amy, Olivia, Lisa, um, everybody, thank you so much. Debbie, um, everybody, thank you for coming. <laughs>